This is a production of Cornell University. Welcome uh, to all of you, and uh, welcome to uh, Professor Francis Fukuyama, uh, back to Cornell. Uh, my name is Nick Vandewal. I'm the director of the Ainaudi Center. And uh, the, the, the talk today is in uh, the context of our Distinguished Speaker Series, uh, which, which has for the last two years been a component of uh, the Ainaudi Center's uh, foreign policy uh, initiative. Uh, the, the objective of the foreign policy initiative uh, in general is to uh, uh, bring to campus uh, a, a more prominent uh, discussion of uh, contemporary uh, foreign policy issues and, and international affairs. We're very grateful uh, uh, to the uh, Ainaudi family for support of this initiative, as well as to the Kessler family uh, and their gift last year. Uh, the, the Distinguished Speaker Series brings to campus different viewpoints on contemporary international politics and economics from noted experts, uh, both from the academic world and the policy world. The current theme for this spring and next fall is American foreign policy in an, in an election year and uh, the legacy of the uh, Bush administration and sort of issues for the next uh, administration in the area of foreign policy. We've had a number of, of um, important speakers on this topic already. Many of you I, I, I recognize from last week's talk by uh, General Zinni. Let me announce uh, several upcoming speakers before presenting today's speaker. Uh, on September 17th, Professor Stephen Krasner uh, of uh, the uh, uh, Graham Stewart Professor of International Relations at Stanford University and uh, 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 someone who spent uh, time working as a special advisor to Condoleezza Rice uh, will be on campus uh, to address this, this general theme. In November, the date hasn't been set yet, uh, Nancy Birdsall, the current uh, director of the Center for Global Development, will be here to talk about uh, uh, prospects for the new administration on vis-a-vis uh, -vis the developing world. Uh, let me also say that we're planning a debate uh, on the future of U.S. involvement in Iraq. Uh, we're looking at a potential date in early October. We haven't said that provisionally right now, October 7th. I hope to be able to say much more about this soon. Let me also say that the um, Bartels Fellow uh, plan for next fall uh, is Louise Arbor, the current UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, and we're also uh, about to set a, uh, a date for that. So let me present today's speaker. Uh, Francis Fukuyama is one of the most influential scholars on American foreign policy, uh, um, who is also happens to be a Cornell alumni. Class of 74. 74. Class of 74. I thought he was a government major, uh, but in fact he was a classics major. Um, uh, uh, Professor Fukuyama is, a, is the Bernard Schwartz Professor of International Political Economy. Um, at the Paul Nietzsche School of Advanced International Studies of Johns Hopkins University in Washington, and he's currently the director of SICE's International Development Program. He's written uh, extremely widely on a number of, of issues relating to political and economic development, from U.S. foreign policy to social capital issues, state building, and even bioethics. His best work I, I would say, is The End of History in the Last Man, which was published in 1992 and has appeared in over 20 foreign editions. It has won a number of prizes. Uh, his most recent book, America at the Crossroads, Democracy, Power, and the Neoconservative Legacy, was published by Yale University Press in March 2006. He is also uh, the chairman of the editorial board of a brand new magazine, I guess, I'm not sure, well, of a new magazine called The American Interest. Uh, Professor Fukuyama received his BA from Cornell University in Classics. He has a PhD from Harvard in Political Science, and he also holds honorary doctorates from Connecticut College and Doane College. He's, uh, uh, in, in addition uh, to working at, uh, at SAIS, he has worked uh, for several stints at the Rand Corporation, at the State Department, and between 2001 and 2005, he served as a member of the President's Council on Bioethics. He's a member of a number of advisory boards, including the National Endowment for Democracy, the Journal of Democracy, and the New American Foundation. Uh, the title of his talk today is American Foreign Policy After the Bush Administration. Please join me in welcoming Prof Professor Fukuyama.
Well, thank you uh, very much. Uh, I really appreciate the invitation I got from uh, Professor Van de Waal to come back to Cornell. Uh, I uh, was here from 1970 to 1974. Uh, I arrived uh, right in the middle of the Vietnam War, uh, a year after the big Cornell crisis, in which uh, Time magazine featured a number of Cornell undergraduates with bandoliers of ammunition around their uh, necks, uh, taking over Willard Strait Hall. Uh, and so here we are 37 years later, uh, and we're still in a war, <laughs> uh, uh, an ill-conceived uh, war. But I must say, I have not seen a single armed student in my, uh, so far this afternoon. So I guess there is progress, uh, there is progress after all. Um, I'm going to talk about, uh, it's necessarily going to have to dwell a bit on, on the Bush uh, legacy, but uh, we are in an election campaign. I do presume that at some point the Democrats will make up their mind as to who their candidate's going to be, and we will, I'm quite certain, have a new president uh, starting in January 2009, and therefore we are at a pretty important uh, decision point with regard to uh, the choices made in American foreign policy. So what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about the ideas that have animated foreign policy in um, in uh, recent years, and then really how uh, reality has uh, or has not uh, coincided with those ideas, and that sets the stage for looking ahead to the kinds of shifts that I think will be necessary, the kinds of adjustments that uh, the new president will have to make uh, as, they, as we um, proceed into the next administration. The Bush Doctrine uh, was actually a fairly a coherent set of ideas. A lot of my uh, uh, neoconservative friends, I think, played an important role in uh, shaping that uh, strategy. I would summarize it uh, very simply as a uh, containing four elements, a very dire uh, threat assessment uh, of um, what would happen uh, as a result of international terrorism following the September uh, 11th attacks, uh, a doctrine of preemption uh, to deal with the problem of terrorism. Uh, third, a willingness, uh, the, the nice way of putting it is to exercise American leadership. The less nice way is American unilateralism in working with uh, allies in dealing with the, the threat. And then finally, uh, the strategic use of democracy promotion as a means of getting at the underlying uh, the purported underlying causes of uh, the terrorist problem. And it was actually uh, stated on quite a number of occasions by the president, by uh, the vice president, by various members of the administration, and it formed the coherent strategy for the first four years. Now, the problem was that I believe uh, the world is actually quite different, and the assumptions, the going-in assumptions that animated uh, that strategy uh, actually are not suitable to the world that has actually emerged in the early 21st century. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the inapplicability of traditional hard power, that is to say military power, to achieve the kinds of political objectives that the United States uh, seeks in a certain important part uh, of the world. Uh, and I think that you can, um, you know, one good way of, of thinking about this is just to consider Iraq itself. Uh, today, the United States spends as much on its defense budget as the whole rest of the world combined. It's a you know, huge disproportion. Uh, and in terms of lift and technology and communications and firepower, uh, the United States military uh, is, uh, you know, has historically, I mean, it has really no uh, rivals whatsoever. And yet Iraq, a small country of about 24 million people, uh, after five years of American occupation is still not stabilized. And so, you know, it's, it's an interesting question why this concentration of modern technology and military power is not able to achieve a relatively straightforward goal in a relatively uh, small country. And the reason uh, that it isn't, uh, I believe, has to do with uh, the fact that uh, we are living in a weak state world that is very different from the kind of strong state world that uh, we are used to thinking about in terms of 20th century politics. If you take a standard international relations course, it's all about the interaction of strong centralized states and the kind of politics that we dealt with in the 20th century with Nazi Germany or Stalin's Russia or you know, the former Soviet Union, uh, Imperial Japan, were all modern centralized states that could enforce rules on their own territory. 
And in that kind of a world, the classic uh, instruments of foreign policy uh, worked, uh, and primarily the instrument of hard military power. And therefore, if you were attacked by another state and you got them to sign a surrender instrument on the deck of a battleship, that was it. The country surrendered and the war was over, uh, and you could then you know, proceed to um, uh, kind of rearrange the, the, you know, the strategic pieces on the chessboard, understanding that most of those chess pieces were under the control of uh, relatively <coughs> coherent uh, forms of political authority. In the greater Middle East, which I would define as beginning in North Africa, extending through much of sub-Saharan Africa, through the Middle East proper, much of Central Asia and South Asia up into the border of India, uh, is characterized by weak and sometimes failing states. And in that kind of world, traditional hard power simply does not work as well. Uh, it is, doesn't work as well because without uh, coherent states in places like Afghanistan, Somalia, uh, Palestine, uh, you know, Gaza, uh, largely ungoverned uh, territories. Much of sub-Saharan Africa, for, uh, especially during the 1990s, uh, was characterized by the collapse of state authority. And that whole region, I think, is, is broadly speaking uh, governed by relatively weak states. The use of hard military power simply does not have the kind of political effect because you cannot deter or coerce or compel uh, states to, to act on uh, the actors that, that operate out of their territory. Lebanon is a really good example of that, Hezbollah. Uh, and in fact, Henry Kissinger, after the 2006 uh, Lebanon war, wrote an article where, and, and it kind of illustrates uh, the, the, the shift in international relations because Kissinger comes out of that traditional uh, 20th century world. But he says, okay, Hezbollah is in fact a metastasization of the Al-Qaeda pattern. It acts openly as a state within a state, a non-state entity on the soil of a state with all the attributes of a state and backed by a major regional power is a new thing in uh, international politics. Well, it may have been news to Henry Kissinger, but if you had been following African politics uh, over the past couple of decades, uh, you would understand that this is exactly the kind of world that has been emerging uh, in that uh, part of the globe. And it is particularly difficult for American foreign policy because we have a tremendous hard power machine that we want to use uh, to solve uh, the problems. And they say when uh, your uh, main tool is a hammer, uh, most of the problems end up looking like nails. And I think that that's one of the difficulties we had in approaching Iraq, that we thought we could solve certain basic political problems through the use of hard power without recognizing that the reconstruction of political authority was um, central to the aims that we wanted to achieve and that we did not really have the tools to, uh, to do that. Uh, and so that's why I think in this part of the world, um, you're going to have to use different kinds of instruments. Uh, uh, we've made uh, the beginnings of an adjustment already in uh, Iraq where we've realized that this is a genuine counterinsurgency war. Uh, and in this kind of a struggle, the overuse of hard power is uh, almost always counterproductive because the central struggle is really, you know, there are, are really bad guys out there that have to be killed, captured, or neutralized, but they're swimming in much larger populations of people that are potentially enemies, potentially friends, uh, or potentially undecided. And if you do not wage a political struggle for the hearts and minds of those broader populations, you are going to lose the, uh, the broader struggle. And so it really requires a very different set of policy instruments to deal in that kind of world. All right, so um, I'm actually going to spend the second half of the talk talking about East Asia. And I believe that East Asia does not uh, follow this model. Japan, China, uh, Korea, uh, the states of, of uh, Southeast Asia are all classic, centralized, relatively strong states with, with a couple of exceptions. And I think the old rules apply much better in that part of the world. But let's, let's just stick with the broader Middle East uh, initially. Now, I think that we have um, been dealing in this world for some time, and we should have learned several important lessons about uh, the way that politics operates in the broader Middle East. The f and, and the lessons affect every single one of those four elements of the Bush doctrine uh, that I just mentioned, the threat, preemption, unilateralism, and democracy. So let's begin with the terrorist threat. 
Uh, the administration after September 11th took an extremely dire um, view of the threat posed by radical Islamism. Uh, President Bush has compared the struggle that we are currently in involved in to the struggles against uh, Hitler's Germany or uh, global communism. Uh, and there's been talk about World War IV and, and, um, uh, and the like. Uh, and I think that one of the problems is that that fundamental analysis of how deep and dangerous the threat was, uh, was considerably overstated. Of course, it's easier to say that after six years since September 11th when there hasn't even been a, you know, a truck bomb or a suicide vest you know, being used on the territory of the United States. But I think that uh, you know, the more we understand about that threat, the more we realize that it was not an existential threat for the future you know, the, or, or struggle over the future of Western civilization, uh, but that actually Osama bin Laden you know, happened to get pretty lucky on September 11th. And, uh, the ability to inflict that kind of catastrophic harm on the United States is actually more limited, much more limited uh, than we thought uh, earlier in that period. There was a discussion about the nature of the threat that got truncated too early. Right after September 11th, uh, everybody asked this question, well, why do, why do they hate us? They uh, being the, the people that had perpetrated the September 11th attacks. And there were two answers that were given. One was that they hate us for who we are. That is to say, they have this fundamental hatred of Western uh, values, and that's what this struggle is all about. And the other was that they just don't like American foreign policy or things that we do in the uh, short run. And uh, I think that the answer to the question, the, the one that President Bush uh, finally chose was, was answer A, that they hate us, you know, and he said this in speeches uh, on a number of occasions, that the terrorists hate freedom and that this is a fundamental fight over freedom. But the problem is that the answer to this question depends on who the they, the antecedent of the they is. If the they is the actual Al-Qaeda uh, jihadist that, that organized September 11th and all of the other t attacks since then, that's probably a fair uh, assessment. But if the they refers to the broader Arab and Muslim populations in uh, countries of the broader Middle East, uh, then the answer is really not so clear. And I think there's a fair amount of evidence that indicates that uh, the abysmally low popularity ratings of the United States in that region actually do not arise from the fact that large numbers of people in that part of the world hate American values, but rather, you know, and I think this is demonstrated by poll after poll, they actually don't like American foreign policy. I mean, they don't like the fact that we invaded Iraq. They don't like uh, what they regard as our um, one-sided support for Israel. They don't like basing you know, American forces in the Persian Gulf. There are all sorts of things that they're unhappy about. But it does not come down to a fundamental clash of values for those broader uh, populations uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, the region. Uh, and therefore, it, uh, I think, reinforces the contention that uh, in a certain sense, the anti-Americanism that's been generated in that part of the world uh, can be dealt with, you know, most effectively not, I mean, obviously you've got to kill, capture, neutralize the, the people that genuinely uh, hate freedom, and there are really people uh, out there uh, for whom this is true, but again, you are dealing in this broader uh, world where uh, your behavior in the short run will very much affect the willingness of the broader populations to help uh, uh, or support uh, uh, the really hardcore uh, and very dangerous uh, people. So again, um, the hearts and minds component of dealing with this threat is very important to treat it as primarily a war that is fought through military means. I mean, obviously, we're doing that now because we've gotten into Iraq and Afghanistan. But on the assumption that we don't invade and occupy any further countries, the war on terrorism is really going to look like a police and an intelligence operation and really not like a war. Now, the second uh, lesson I would draw from the past uh, few years is that preventive war cannot be the basis of American non-proliferation policy. The Bush doctrine emphasized uh, preemption uh, in actually a perfectly logical manner. They said, OK, uh, they attacked us on September 11th. This is a stateless group. You cannot use deterrence and containment to deal with this kind of a threat because they have no return address. And therefore, the tools that we use during the Cold War are not adequate 
You have to go out and get them before they uh, get you. And that logic, uh, I think, is pretty iron tight. Uh, they uh, invaded, uh, the United States invaded Afghanistan on that ground to you know, stop uh, these people that had attacked us once and would attack us again. And I think everybody pretty much accepted the legitimacy of that type of preemption. Problem was that this tool of preemption was then used for a different policy purpose, which was to deal with a different but less difficult uh, foreign policy problem, which was the rogue state proliferation problem. It's less, dif I mean, it's potentially more dangerous because you are talking about nuclear proliferation, but in a certain sense, because the potential proliferators, you know, the famous axis of evil, Iraq, Iran, uh, and North Korea, our states, uh, they are, uh, in my view, uh, susceptible to the kind of deterrence calculation, even if their foreign policies in many respects seem uh, you know, pretty crazy. Uh, I think that uh, states really have a very different calculus when it comes to the use of uh, nuclear weapons. But you know, the rogue state problem and the Al-Qaeda terrorist problem were all mushed together into a single uh, kind of uh, inchoate threat. And the use of preemption was directed against that second uh, uh, category of problems. And I think that, you know, in all honesty, it actually made the problem worse. I think the administration hoped that by preemptively um, invading Iraq, it would raise the potential cost of proliferation so high that North Korea and Iran wouldn't think of doing that. Uh, that may have happened in the case of Libya, but North Korea and Iran actually accelerated their nuclear programs uh, once it was pretty clear that we were bogged down uh, in Iraq because for them, perfectly rationally, if you want to avoid uh, being invaded by the United States and having your regime change, you get a nuclear weapon and they're not going to do it to you. Right? Uh, so I think Iran's uh, motive for wanting a nuclear weapon despite you know, all their protestations to the contrary is pretty real and, and it's also uh, uh, you know, strategically, uh, from their standpoint, uh, pretty easy to understand why, if they can get away with it, they uh, would want to try to do that. So we did not solve the non-proliferation problem in this manner, and I do not believe that as a general policy, uh, preventive war can be used um, uh, in uh, this fashion. The third uh, thing I think that we uh, should have learned from the experience of the last few years is that you really need to deal with the proliferation problem, with the hearts and minds problem, with a whole series of foreign policy challenges uh, in a much more um, multilateral way. And actually, at this point, it's not even worth kind of making the argument because I think the Bush administration has pretty much agreed uh, itself with this because if you look at the way they've handled uh, North Korea and Iran in the second uh, four years, uh, it's much more multilateral, working through the six-party talks on the Korean Peninsula or working with the Europeans uh, with, regard to, um, uh, with regard to Iran. But it's important to understand what the problem, what the fundamental problem was. And here, I think uh, there is a kind of, there's a, there's a history here that's important for people to keep in mind because we have not solved the problem of collective action in dealing with important security challenges or even humanitarian uh, operations yet. In the 1990s, the UN uh, and the Europeans collectively failed to solve the problem in the Balkans. Uh, we have now, it's now like the 12th anniversary of Srebrenica and these other you know, horrible uh, instances in which um, uh, aggression in the Balkans was met very passively, you know, UN peacekeepers were taken hostage, and that experience, I think, forms the backdrop for the uh, Bush administration saying, okay, we're just not going to bother with these defective uh, institutions that cannot provide uh, either legitimacy or an effective basis for, for dealing with terrorism, human rights violations, refugees, you know, any of the problems that the world uh, faces in uh, security terms, and they said, we're just going to lead and we'll have other people follow us, and they will salute us when they see that we are uh, acting uh, effectively. And so they kind of went to the opposite uh, extreme uh, in terms of coalitions of the willing uh, and the like. And they got into big trouble because, in fact, uh, well, it was a couple of things. First of all, it turns out that the United States, uh, given its own constraints, simply couldn't handle 
uh, the problem all by itself. Uh, it could have used the legitimacy that the United Nations might have brought in the re, uh, rebuilding of Iraq in Afghanistan. We're desperately short uh, of troops. Uh, we are heavily dependent on uh, NATO allies to uh, prevent the Taliban from uh, taking over that country. But there is also this deeper problem that I think nobody adequately appreciated uh, in the earlier part of the decade, which was that we are flying into this big headwind of anti-Americanism that I think is simply a structural feature of, uh, of the uh, world today. And it didn't begin with the Bush administration. You already saw this uh, emerging in the Clinton years. And I think the reason is pretty straightforward. Uh, because of the disproportionate influence that the United States has exercised uh, militarily, culturally, uh, economically, politically, it sets up this position of non-reciprocity. That is to say, we can overturn a regime 8,000 miles away basically without breaking a sweat, but other countries can't do the same thing to us. Or, you know, we have, um, we make uh, economic policy decisions that are very uh, uh, consequential to uh, other countries in financial uh, crisis, uh, but the rest of the world, uh, uh, again, does not have a reciprocal uh, degree of influence. And this really did start in economic issues in the Clinton administration, where uh, many close American European allies uh, greatly resented what they regarded as an American uh, orchestrated globalization that they felt was designed to undermine their own a welfare state and social protection uh, mechanism. And you know, the real story is more complicated than that, but that was uh, a lot of the perception. And so you had already anti-globalization protests outside of American borders with globalization seen as the cutting edge of, of American uh, global hegemony. And I think all the Bush people did was they shifted that argument into the military security realm uh, where they ran into exactly that same kind of anti-Americanism. And that, I think, uh, uh, you know, the structural basis of that anti-Americanism is, um, uh, is something that any future administration is going to have to take into account. And although, because it's structural, you, you know, as long as you're powerful, you're going to be resented. Uh, I think that the way you exercise that power at the margin can, you know, make a big difference uh, with regard to how people are, uh, how willing they're going to be to legitimate and uh, what you do and to cooperate uh, with you. The, Final uh, component, uh, or the, the final lesson I think we should have learned uh, has to do with the role of democracy promotion and the idealistic agenda uh, of um, American foreign policy. Uh, president Bush was not the first president to talk about democracy promotion. I mean, there's a, I mean it, it, in a way it goes back to the founding of the American Republic, but certainly since Woodrow Wilson, this idealistic component has been part of the rhetoric of virtually every uh, American administration with, you know, one or two exceptions uh, ever, uh, ever since then. But President Bush, in a sense, raised democracy promotion to a very different position in American foreign policy. If you go back to his second inaugural address that was given in January of 2005, he talked about democracy uh, as the basis of American grand strategy. It wasn't about uh, aircraft carriers or nuclear weapons or, you know, army divisions. It was all about, um, first of all, the lack of democracy, particularly in the Arab world, being the deep root cause for uh, terrorism and therefore the need to promote democracy in that part of the world as a means of getting at the underlying causes of uh, everything that had happened since September uh, 11th. Now, for reasons that I can't go into here, I think that that was in itself a wrong, uh, uh, a wrong analysis, but this strong connection between democracy promotion and American strategic interests, I think, uh, had a disastrous effect both for American foreign policy and for the cause of democracy uh, around the world. Uh, it, it was not good for American foreign policy because it made us look hypocritical. You know, no sooner uh, did that second uh, inaugural get, uh, 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 get delivered and Condi Rice you know, made uh, similar statements in Cairo and other Arab capitals, then you get the election of Hamas, the election of Mr. Ahmadinejad in Iran, the uh, Muslim brother, brothers doing well in Egypt, a whole series of Islamists using democratic elections to come to power and what do you think? Well, the administration immediately backs off um, 
this emphasis on democracy, and you know, it um, uh, makes us look tremendously hypocritical. So if you go to the Middle East right now and you try to talk about American ideals of human rights, you know, and this is coming on top of Guantanamo Bay and prisoner abuse and a lot of, I think, very unfortunate things that we've done in reaction to September 11th, people will just laugh at you. you know, they will simply laugh at you uh, and they'll say, you know, who the hell are you to be lecturing anybody in the world about this? Now, I, in all fairness, I think that you know, we, that's also not a fair charge, but certainly uh, that perception was very much um, fortified by this close uh, union between strategic interest and, and democracy. Truth of the matter is, you know, the United States is a great power. We've got interest in oil, in security, in anti-terrorism. We want to support uh, allies. Uh, and, you know, it's never the case that democracy promotion will ever be uh, the single most important goal that Americans ever pursue uh, at the expense of those other things. But, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be a component. And so, of course, we're going to look hypocritical. But in some sense, by, by promoting democracy promotion, uh, to that extent, you underline the hypocrisy, the inevitable and necessary uh, hypocrisy when uh, it's visible. It's also not good for, this, for the cause of actually promoting democracy on the ground. Uh, the administration is so unpopular, especially in the Middle East, that a lot of uh, democratic groups there are simply not willing to take uh, American money for fear of being tainted. Congress, about two years ago, appropriated about $75 million to support uh, pro-democratic groups which exist in, uh, in Iran and not a penny of that money has been spent in Iran itself because it's simply way too dangerous for uh, anyone uh, to accept it. So uh, this uh, component of uh, American foreign policy has been uh, uh, you know, quite uh, problematic. All right, so let's, uh, so we've now begun you know, talking about some of the changes that I think need to be made. Uh, obviously, I think you need to talk about the threat quite differently. You need to change the conduct of the war of terrorism uh, in ways that make it look much more like a global counterinsurgency or a police operation rather than uh, an active war. We can talk about you know, how you're going to get out of Iraq. I mean, I, I don't have a particularly good suggestion about that, but obviously that is something, you know, winding that down is something that's going to have to happen uh, in the uh, next administration. But in terms of the Hearts and Minds campaign, there's another important uh, component that is missing in our foreign policy and really needs to be there. Uh, my colleague at SICE, uh, Mike Mandelbaum, uh, in the early 1990s wrote an article in Foreign Affairs uh, with the title uh, Foreign Policy as Social Work. Uh, this was when the Clinton administration was involved in Haiti and Somalia and getting involved in the Balkans. And he was quite actually uh, contemptuous of uh, this type of humanitarian intervention, and the uh, you know the thrust of his message was real foreign policy is about hard power, it's about traditional diplomacy, it's about dealing with uh, other states. And I have to say that looking at this part of the world, uh, I actually think that I would like to rewrite that article, but without the irony, because I actually do think that you need a little bit more social work in your uh, foreign policy. Uh, if you look at the groups that are the most hostile to the United States, uh, Hezbollah, uh, Hamas, uh, you know, the people that voted for Ahmadinejad in, in um, Iran, or you come to this hemisphere, people that voted for Hugo Chavez in Venezuela or Evo Morales uh, uh, and other populists in Latin America, in many cases the basis for their uh, support of these leaders is actually not foreign policy or anti-Americanism. It is because all of these uh, groups have uh, social agendas. And in the case of you know, virtually all of them, they actually, their parties, their political parties are busy uh, directly delivering social services like schools, clinics, uh, uh, other kinds of social needs. And one of the big problems in American foreign policy is that that um, that component that appeals to poorer populations in developing countries has been really missing from our uh, rhetoric and from the panoply of things that we have to offer the rest of the world. Our foreign policy has been largely built on democracy promotion and free trade as an engine to economic growth. There's nothing wrong with that agenda. Uh, I believe that those are, in fact, uh, you know, good things in themselves, and they go together, and 
they fit with American values and so forth, but they really do not appeal in many countries to poor and excluded people. They tend to appeal more to you know, better educated uh, middle classes. And one of the reasons that the United States has been losing influence in, uh, you know, in, in the Andean part of, uh, well, I mean, in all of Latin America, but particularly in the Andean uh, countries, is that we have simply not been seen as offering uh, anything in the social realm or anything to deal uh, directly with problems of, uh, of, uh, of poverty or social uh, exclusion. And so I think as we go forward, one of the issues that we are going to have to address is how you can actually uh, do that in a way, given what the American government is and what it is and is not uh, capable of. The um, final really big issue, uh, it's more of an inside the beltway kind of thing, but it's really important, is implementation. One of the really distressing things about the way that the American government has worked over the past seven years is, is just the sheer level of incompetence at actually administering policies. Uh, so you invade Iraq, but you don't you know, plan for the aftermath. You're actually in a con counterinsurgency war, but you know, the military doesn't admit this for you know, two or three years. Uh, you um, actually go through the two really big uh, reorganizations of the federal government, of the intelligence community, and of homeland security. And as far as I can tell, both of those reorganizations have actually made things worse rather than, uh, rather than better. But you know, Hurricane Katrina, I mean, there's a lot of cases where even when we are agreed on what we want to do, uh, in our policy, somehow our bureaucracies and our agencies are not able to actually deliver, uh, uh, deliver the uh, goods. And uh, this is something where, you know, again, in, in thinking about the, the hearts and minds uh, part of the campaign, we really need to think about uh, how to strengthen the soft power dimensions or the soft power instruments that we have uh, available to us. Uh, the funding part of it is actually good, and the one you know one area where uh, the administration doesn't get nearly enough credit is actually in things like foreign aid, PEPFAR as the president's um, emergency plan for AIDS uh, relief, or the Millennium Challenge Corporation, or general levels of spending on foreign assistance have gone way way up in, in this administration. So the problem is not resources; problem is that our current institutional structure is really not good at delivering is, in translating those dollars into real uh, results on the ground. Um, you know, just to take a couple of examples, uh, uh, coordination of nation building uh, was a disaster in, uh, in Iraq. I mean, it was a lesser disaster in Afghanistan, but it also wasn't a pretty uh, uh, site there. There were some efforts to create an office of a special coordinator uh, to deal with this in the State Department. It didn't get funded, and now what's happening is the Pentagon is basically taking over all these uh, civilian uh, uh, kinds of functions, and that's not, I think, an ideal setup. We've gone through, in fact, you, um, Steve Krasner was very much involved in this uh, so-called F process to reorganize the foreign uh, assistance account, and that has also not, uh, unfortunately, not uh, worked terribly well, and what it's meant is you get a lot of micromanagement of, uh, of that uh, money from uh, Washington, and that's something that's going to have to be unwound and completely uh, redone in the next um, uh, in the next administration. Okay, uh, I'm running a little bit late, so I'm going to have to give Asia a little bit of a short shrift. I'm going <laughs> to switch our attention to another part of the world because I think that actually the bigger set of issues, while we've been preoccupied with terrorism in the Middle East, you've got this really big set of issues in East Asia that have to do with the rise of China and how you think about it and how you deal with it because China is going to, I'm, I'm not convinced that you know, Osama bin Laden and his friends are going to be around in 25 years. But believe me, China is going to be there, and they're going to be a lot more uh, powerful, and so will India, and so will a lot of other uh, uh, growing uh, uh, powers uh, in that uh, part of the world. Now, if you look at the history of uh, rising powers, it doesn't give you a lot of confidence because there are plenty of cases where the international system has not dealt well with, with new powers. A classic case of this was Germany, uh, after 1870, after German unification, where uh, the mishandling of the emergence of this new, very large power in the center of Europe by England and France basically set the stage for uh, the First uh, World War. Uh, the only case where there's been a graceful accommodation of a rising power that I can think of was actually 
Britain accommodating the rise of the United States uh, as the U.S. in the 20th century emerged as a major global uh, naval power, and we pretty much peacefully uh, uh, displaced Britain uh, in, uh, in that role. But you know, there are a lot of cultural and other reasons why that was a relatively easy uh, accommodation, and uh, you know, the, these things don't often uh, go very well. We have been hoping that the problem will be solved by China becoming a democracy because uh, you know, there's an argument uh, supported by a certain amount of data that democracies don't fight one another and that the real problem with China is the fact that it's run by an authoritarian uh, communist party. Um, the, the larger question of whether democracies fight each other we can argue about you know, separately, but I think that there's actually very little chance that in the short run, meaning in the next 10 to 15 years, that, that China will democratize. Uh, and the argument is, is actually pretty straightforward. Uh, a lot of times people have said that economic development brings pressure for democratization because you have a new <coughs> rising middle class that owns property and therefore wants uh, a share of political power in order to get the government to protect uh, those, that new wealth and those new uh, property rights. That, I think, is a decent argument if the vast uh, majority of your citizens actually consider themselves to be middle class and do own property. But the problem with China is that its development has become very uneven. Its Gini coefficient, the measure of inequality, has gone up by about 10 points over the last uh, 20 years. The top 10% in China earns something like 19 times the, the, you know, that of the bottom uh, 10%. And so what you have is maybe you know, two, 300 million people that have benefited tremendously from China's modernization, but an awful lot of people left in the countryside that uh, have been uh, left behind by China's rapid economic growth. And uh, everything that I have seen suggests that none of those new elites in China really wants democracy in the short run because they know that it's going to unleash all of these pent-up demands for redistribution and they are not going to be able to protect their gains under that uh, situation. Now, when China becomes a much richer country and instead of you know, two-thirds of the country still being left in the countryside, it's down to like 20% uh, or so, you know, which is more like where South Korea and Taiwan were in the 1980s when they democratized, then I actually think that uh, there will be pressure for democracy. Uh, China actually may be the first country that democratizes because of environmental concerns. You know, uh, China is poisoning itself. Uh, it's like an early stage capitalist country where developers and companies and local governments, you know, are all colluding to deprive people of property and, and you know, violating the country's own labor and environmental laws. And I think ultimately the only way that you solve these kinds of issues politically is actually by having more democratic uh, uh, participation from uh, from the grassroots, but you know I think this is a development that will not solve the uh, foreign policy problem of a rising China, you know, for a good uh, generation uh, or so. So it's still going to be uh, it's still going to be an uh, uh, an issue in Asia. I think the basic choices really have to do with the kind of institutional uh, security architecture that is put in place. Um, it's interesting that in contrast to the period right after 1945 where all of the, you know, the wise, uh, wise men of American post-war policy, you know, guys like uh, Dean Acheson and George Kennan, all of them thought in institutional terms and their more, most enduring legacy were, were things like the Bretton Woods institutions, NATO, uh, the United Nations, um, um, the U.S.-Japan Security Alliance, all of these institutions are still in place uh, more than 50 years later and they still structure the way that countries interact and there has apart from the WTO there's been very little top level institutional creativity exercised and certainly in this administration uh, although I would say that their Asia policy probably gets a you know maybe a B plus or a B or so uh, it's also been just extremely pragmatic and not architectural it hasn't been thinking about uh, longer term institutions and in the case of managing China, I think that that's important. Uh, you know, the, 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 the real issue that everybody would like to know right now is as China gets more powerful and as it uh, commands a greater and greater share of global GDP, are its ambitions going to expand 
Or is it the case that it will, in some sense, uh, uh, become a stakeholder in international uh, institutions and modify its own objectives and uh, so forth? I mean, this is a great hope of uh, liberal uh, internationalism. And I think that, uh, you know, people come at this problem with preconceived notions. You know, they're either realists or they're liberal uh, internationalists, and so they kind of assume an answer. And I would say that, you know, it's, it's going to be hard to tell. It would be hard to imagine China not having greater ambitions once they become very powerful. But it's also the case that one of the reasons that people accept uh, international rules is that it is in their self-interest in doing this. And right now, uh, China is all over uh, sub-Saharan Africa. They're all over Latin America in search of energy, in search of commodities, raw materials. They're digging up you know, a lot of the developing world in Western Australia and all shipping it you know, to, uh, to ports in China. Uh, under basically a fairly cynical principle of respect for everyone's sovereignty, so that basically you just you know you don't complain about the way anyone governs their own people, you just do business with them. And what they're finding is that they're getting a lot of pushback. I mean, you know, you've of course had this thing with the Olympic uh, torch, but I think in 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 more uh, ways that that are also quite important. You know, when you put in a energy project that then uh, generates local backlash and, and guerrillas shooting at your workers uh, and things of that sort, as has happened with the Chinese energy investment in uh, in Sudan, then you think, well, maybe um, you know a more politically sensitive uh, approach to these problems might uh, be in order. And so therefore, I think that there needs to be in Asia careful attention to um, you know thinking through whether there are institutional arrangements for uh, making sure that nationalism between Japan, China, and uh, Korea, among other things, does not get out of hand, channels of communication, institutionalized ways of doing business in terms of investment uh, and trade. On that front, you know, there, there are institutions. I mean, it's, it's much more institutionalized in the economic than it is in the, in the security realm. Uh, but this is a place where um, this is the time to do it, if you're going to do it. Uh, the, the time when it's not going to work uh, is when China is as powerful as the United States. You have some chance if you get Chinese buy-in to all of this uh, at a time when they're relatively weaker and, and the United States is relatively stronger, uh, that you develop certain habits of interacting in certain channels of communication uh, and, um, uh, and the like. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, this is not a, you know, they're really, I mean, there are other parts of the world that uh, we've not touched on, you know, Africa, development, Latin America, uh, and so forth. Uh, unfortunately, everybody wants to come up with a grand overarching strategy like containment uh, to deal with the next generation of problems in foreign policy. And that's, I think, a fundamental mistake because, in fact, you then try to cram all of the existing cases as lesser included cases of your big paradigm. And first of all, your big paradigm may be wrong, but secondly, almost none of the lesser cases are actually included ones. They're actually separate things that need separate policies uh, to deal with. Uh, but I think that's kind of the lay of the land, and that is the agenda that I would think uh, the, whoever occupies the White House in uh, next January is going to need to uh, think through. So thank you uh, very much for your attention. Professor Fugia has agreed to answer some questions, so we can open up the floor. Please keep your, your questions uh, brief. Uh, yeah. I would like first to comment on the statement in the program by Director Onyadi Center, where he said, decision made by the international community in the coming years will have significant impact on us. Well, I really would like you to add more that so far, the United States is the one doing the most impact on the world not the other way around, though we are concerned about this. And as you, uh, the speaker said, clearly uh, the United States impact on the world, not the other way around. Yeah. My question is the following. The Bush policy, which really is, I mean, I understand you have to call it Bush policy. It's really the policy of Cheney, Wolf of Witz, Perl, including yourself. Uh, that formulated the overall uh, framework for that policy is clearly a failure. And you said that yourself. 
Now, you have not really two things I want to comment on. The first, in all this discussion and speech, you have not mentioned a word, one word, about the impact of this strategy and policy on the miserable situation of the people on land, whether millions of Iraqis or so many hundreds of thousands of deaths, etc. Please do mention that. To give some, some humanity to your presentation. My question you have, according to your title, you're giving us American foreign policy after, mm -hmm. but you really have not given any. Assume that you are the Condoleezza Rice and Cheney of the next president. What specific you going to do in January, you recommend, especially for the Middle East? Be specific. You have to be specific because you have, you will be living in a real world. Well, <laughs> with all due respect, I thought I had answered a lot of those, uh, uh, those issues. I mean, look, in terms of uh, expressing sympathy for people that have been harmed by decisions that the United States made, I mean, I think that, you know, I mean, I didn't think I had to state that explicitly because I, I would say that when you call something a big failure, you, you kind of take that uh, for granted. And that's something, you know, that Americans need to uh, consider you know, that when they act and if they are not wise in those actions or they make mistakes, uh, it's, you know, a political black eye for the people that made the decision, but it, you know, it's personally, you know, uh, means the loss of your life or livelihood or a lot of other things for the, you know, the people on the ground, as you say. So, you know, I uh, appreciate that and I think that that is a, uh, that is a good point. Uh, I mean, just to repeat what I said, I mean, first of all, I would run the war on terrorism much, much differently, uh, which is to say I'd stop calling it a war. Uh, I would, uh, I think that um, you need to get out of Iraq because as long as you're occupying a major uh, Arab capital, you are not going to ultimately get at a lot of the sources of, you know, of recruitment into these, uh, uh, into these uh, uh, groups. Uh, they have already under this administration re-engaged on the Palestinian issue. It was a tremendous mistake not to have done that uh, earlier. I'm, you know, having worked on that issue when I was in the State Department in the 1980s, I'm not really confident, you know, how much progress can be made, but, you know, certainly uh, you uh, need to try. I mean, if, you know, since I was trying to cover the whole world, it's a little bit hard to simply list specific policies for every country, but I'll just give you, uh, I'll give you uh, one example of an adjustment. Uh, I believe that, you know, that, that I, I actually fear that the United States, as a result of Iraq, is going to go back to a Kissinger-like realism where people are going to say, well, the hell with all these countries. As long as they're not shooting at us, we're just going to pretty much uh, ignore them and not worry about things like democracy. And I think that that is a big mistake. And so that has to be part of the agenda. I think it's achieved with soft power rather than with hard power. But it's funny that the, uh, you know, the Bush administration didn't even follow through on its own wisdom in a country, for example, like Pakistan. Uh, so in that country, we have put all of our eggs in uh, Musharraf's basket. Uh, I think we would have done much better actually to let democratic processes work there because Pakistan you know, is actually a country you know, where you get lawyers, you know, these guys in these black suits that go out on the streets, you know, and face down the police to defend the rule of law. And so, you know, you have people that are serious about sharing a lot of, uh, of American uh, values. The, you know, the Islamist party in the Northwest Frontier actually in the February election uh, did pretty badly when they were allowed to come to power and people saw that they couldn't govern. And so I think that if actually if the president had followed the instinct, you know, to a certain extent in that in that second inaugural and actually let some of these democratic uh, processes play through and accept uh, you know, some of the results because they represent important you know, sectors of each of these societies, I think that our policy would have been uh, better anchored. So <laughs> we can pick a lot of countries where I could be you know, much more specific. I was just trying to lay out you know, some general principles about how I think uh, uh, you, need to, um, you, know, you need to make adjustments. Uh, yes. Yeah, okay, sorry. You can... I was wondering if you could speak about Barack Obama's concept of dignity promotion, because it does sound at least abstractly similar to what you're saying. Um, and what is the over-under on the type of social work you're raising? For example, 
uh, does a continuation of the Bush Doctrine on hard power, uh, which is basically what John McCain himself is saying he's offering, can that be mitigated or ameliorated by the type of social reform policy you're advocating? <coughs> does it balance out? Or as a precondition, do you have to disengage uh, from military engagements like Iraq? Because if I'm reading it right, it wouldn't sound like you could support a McCain foreign policy to balance out. It would seem like you'd have to get out of Iraq and do the other things you're calling for. It, it all depends on the specific country and region and, and, and so forth. So I think that in the Persian Gulf, it's pretty hard to uh, get things back to kind of stable equilibrium until the United States is, is out of Iraq. But that doesn't, you know, win you very much in Venezuela or in Ecuador uh, or in you know, parts of Latin America. Whereas having uh, a set of soft power instruments that can actually meet some of the needs of, let's say, indigenous peoples in you know, rural areas in Bolivia uh, or Ecuador uh, actually could uh, win you something. And, and actually, again, to give him credit, you know, in, in the last time the president was down there, it was the first time in his administration he's actually used the word poverty. You know, and said uh, and, and in inequality, and talking about those as things that are of concern to the United States, right? Uh, so I think that again, uh, you have to have a uh, a policy that's very much tailored to the specific uh, conditions of the part of the world uh, in which uh, you are uh, you are operating, and actually, the degree to which all of these things are tied together. Uh, can sometimes be uh, exaggerated. So, you know, you can still make uh, progress, you know, I mean, whatever progress you can make, for example, on the Israeli-Palestinian issue, uh, you're going to make, uh, I think, um, in a way that's separate from exactly what's going on in Iraq and what the American force level is uh, there and, and so forth. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, how about, sir? Yeah. Um, Okay. A couple you. of quick questions. Um, the, first, the first is when you talk about democracy should have been uh, pursued in Pakistan, it almost sounds to me like you're saying, well, in Pakistan, Benazir Bhutto would have won, and that's a, a, a effectively a US ally, so democracy is good there. But in Venezuela and in, uh, in, in, the, in Gaza, democracy is not such a good idea because it produces the wrong result. You think that. Maybe simple-minded, but you really think that the idea of promoting democracy was as an institution, or was it because there was a blind faith that democracy would, in fact, produce results like Benazir Bhutto and not produce results like Hamas? Yeah. Um, that's the first I think I want to ask. And the second was um, when you talk about the the failure of. Uh, or, or the non-utility of hard force in the present world um, and, and the fact that it doesn't work with non-strong state uh, actors. I was thinking about that while you were talking and I thought, well, it, is it that we're, we're not tough enough? That, I mean, the Gestapo did a pretty good job <coughs> of maintaining uh, uh, people, of getting rid of their enemies in occupied Europe and uh, Israel, who seems to be more or less concentrating on hard power, meaning assassinations and, uh, and keeping down the, 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 the possibilities of the Palestinians uh, arming them, they have been able to create a certain sense of security for a long time. So is it, why can't we do things like that? Is it our innate goodness that doesn't let us do it, or, or it doesn't really matter? <laughs> Uh, well, um, first of all, on the question of elections, um, yeah, it is, uh, it is the case that um, there, there are a lot of circumstances in which uh, early elections uh, are uh, actually not good for the country, and there are certainly a lot of cases where they wouldn't be good from the standpoint of American foreign policy. Uh, so right now, if you had an election, free election, free and fair election in Saudi Arabia, I don't know what would come out of the end of it, but it probably wouldn't be better than what we've got uh, now. And so, you know, pushing for that in the short, I mean, it's not much of an issue there anyhow, but, you know, pushing for that I would not think would be, you know, all that great a, a possibility. But I think that part of the reality that makes these, this part of the world so hard to govern is that you've had 
on the ground the mobilization of a lot of new social actors. You know, Sam Huntington talked about this as, as one of the reasons that political development is, is hard, is that you get all these people mobilized and then uh, they're not accommodated into the existing uh, political structure. But I think that the elections are actually just a, a symptom of that mobilization. I mean, I wish that all these people in Gaza hadn't voted for Hamas, but the reason that they did that is that they have, you know, uh, a lot of frustrations and, and, you know, they feel a, a certain way towards Israel. And if you don't have the election and they don't get elected, that's not going to exchange their feelings. And it's not going to, uh, you know, it, 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 it's not going to um, somehow shape uh, the views of, of Palestinians or, or mean that they're more willing to, uh, to make peace with Israel. So in some sense, the elections are simply kind of measures or, or you know, they, 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 they are symptoms of uh, the underlying, uh, you know, changes that are going on in these societies. And that's why I think you actually have to be a little bit more forward-leaning and you're willing to accept the fact that, you know, this group is now electing people and they don't like you, but you've got to figure out, you know, how to, you know, work them into a political system rather than having them shoot their way uh, into power, which is really the alternative that, uh, <clears throat> that most of them uh, would take. Uh, yeah, and I think the answer on your second one, I mean, I think you answered your own question. Yeah, we could behave, well, even the Gestapo, uh, uh, you know, in the end, uh, uh, you know, I mean, you had a couple of, of efforts to do that. Uh, you know, the Soviet Union was another one in which uh, Stalin was willing to murder, you know, literally tens of, of millions of people in order to achieve power, and that system crumbled, you know, uh, shortly after uh, he died because... People didn't want to live under that repressive uh, system. Uh, so even if the United States were that kind of country, I don't think it would work. But we're not that, you know, fortunately, we're not that kind of country. And we have to accept the fact that we, you know, stand for certain ideals. And we're not going to, uh, you know, be ruthless in our uh, exercise of, uh, you know, that kind of power. Yes, at the back. Okay, I've heard two things that are, like, the one that I'll take with me forever from uh -huh. here on one is soft politics and the other one is social work. But I try to mix uh, like us and you into the puzzle and I have a question for you mm -hmm. on regard that. What can we do and what are you doing to change the mind setting to, to make the American politics and the common administration but also the society to push this, this interest to make the social impact? On, on the developing countries and in the middle places. And not just here, but from the Chinese. You said they're looking for resources everywhere, like South, South Saharan Africa and Latin America. But how can they cluster that agenda with social work? They are doing it, and the European Union is doing it in the Eastern Europe, but the Americans are not so successful yet in with the resources search, even in Brazil and all these new petroleum to force their mindset to also give something back with the social work. I point an example. I've been trying to seduce Dr. Scorton to give this soft politic push with the universities and to bring virtual universities to all these developing places. And they say, no, 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 because there is no research or there is no profit. But until they, you know, even the academia thinks that there is a bigger responsibility in the soft politics, I just think that the profit, profit, profit vision can happen with squishing. Well, <laughs> uh, not quite sure where to begin in answering that. Uh, um, first of all, I actually don't think you're giving enough credit uh, to the United States as a society in terms of what uh, it is doing. Now, I would be the first to admit that our official aid programs leave a lot to be desired. Um, USAID has, right from the start, been a very troubled agency, low morale, encumbered by all sorts of political constraints in the way that it operates, encumbered by uh, a kind of dysfunctional bureaucratic culture. They're basically now a big contracting agency, and you know, they don't have you know, any of the core capacities to really deliver uh, the kinds of social services uh, you know, that I'm talking about. So if you're actually going to try to fix that component of um, uh, American soft power, you've got to think about certain institutional changes in the whole structure of that, you know, 
uh, that, that side of it. But, you know, the other uh, thing that I think you're not giving adequate credit to is that Americans are involved in a whole lot of things in developing countries that are not given through official A channels. I mean, I run uh, in my school an international development program. Probably two-thirds of the people that graduate from that program are going to go out into the field in a developing country and work in an NGO or with a multilateral institution or some other kind of development agency trying to deliver exactly these uh, sorts of services. And if you go to Africa, you know, like 10% of the GDP of, of sub-Saharan Africa as a whole comes out of these donor uh, you know, uh, from, from these both official and, and unofficial donors. Now, it's another question whether this is actually doing any good uh, uh, because you can also argue that, you know, actually giving all those resources, you know, undermines governance and a lot of other things. But uh, it's not for, for want of trying. Uh, so uh, in terms of that, I, I think that as a matter of public policy, the parts that are potentially the most fixable uh, have to do with the actual mechanisms by which we uh, deliver uh, development assistance. And I, unfortunately, that particular issue is always like item number 32 in the agenda of any new president, you know, and the, what they're going to accomplish in the first 100 days. This is not going to be uh, up at the top, and so it generally gets left until, you know, a uh, later part of the administration when they've already blown all their political capital on other things. and they're now looking around for something else to do uh, so that they can claim some area of achievement. And uh, I, hope it doesn't, I hope it doesn't happen that way. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, in your uh, second part of the talk, yeah. it seems that this is a somehow more important part because uh, the first part basically is failure. And the second part we are talking about, we are now at a moment of historical opportunity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to set up a new agenda mm -hmm. in East Asia mm -hmm. with dealing with China challenge as a kind of central yeah. aim. And there's two points that are particularly interesting, I noticed. One, you mentioned that um, China probably will become the first country to become democratic because of environmental pressure. That's something extremely interesting because of you are absolutely right. China is a country with tremendous environmental uh, challenges. And uh, compared with the United States, you know, China was such a resource a positive country. Mm -hmm. So what is your logic? Because it could be that environmental pressure will force China mm -hmm. to become less positive toward a path toward democracy. You know, because how to concentrate, yeah. you know, uh, administrative and all kinds of uh, power and resources toward making the society's orderly development yeah. Yeah. is really a way with uh, environmental, you know, issue. And second, you mentioned that this is time to try to come up with some kind of institutional design. Mm -hmm. And that's, again, extremely interesting. Do you mean that this institutional design should try to institutionalize China's being increasingly an insider yeah. mm -hmm. of the international system? Mm -hmm. If that was the case, what kind of specific design do you have in your mind? Okay. Well, um, look, I'm not an expert on China, and you should probably be telling me the answer to your own questions. But on, uh, with regard to the first one, this is my understanding of what China's political problem is, that the... The, the real problem in China is not at the central government level in, in Beijing. The big problem are all of these uh, township and village enterprises, these you know, local government bodies that were the mechanism that the, the regime used to promote the early phases of the uh, modernization. They've all grown extremely rich and very powerful. A lot of them are in cahoots with developers and you know these are the people that are dispossessing peasants of their land and provoking all of these you know violent uh, uh, incidents in response they're the ones that are dumping all this bad stuff into rivers and into the air uh, and so forth and actually the big problem that the Chinese central government has is that they are not strong enough to actually clamp down on these local uh, political bodies and, and make them obey uh, rules that are actually on the books in terms of, of Chinese law. 
And so, you know, so my perception is that they're kind of riding this tiger and they're trying to figure out, uh, you know, how to get control down at this, you know, this uh, grassroots level uh, with all of these people that are doing things that are, that are provoking. I mean, I don't know if I mentioned this little factoid, but last year there's something like 4,000 violent, you know, uh, uh, reported incidents of violent protest in uh, China as a result of people in local communities suffering from you know this kind of uh, this kind of exploitation, and the reason that I think that democracy figures into this is that I don't think that you can solve this kind of problem in a top-down fashion. There's never going to be a, a system by which the government is going to be so administratively powerful that it can pull all of these local government bodies into line. I think that that has to come as a result of greater political participation. And so therefore, on a grassroots level, all of these people that are suffering under this current system you know, are, are going to have to be formally uh, cut in. Now, on the second question, it just so happens that I uh, have just uh, published a new book on this subject about East Asian multilateralism uh, that, in fact, just was, uh, came out this past uh, week. Uh, and <laughs> if you actually want to get a lot more specific suggestions about specific institutions, uh, you can look in that book. And yes, basically, the big design uh, question is, uh, do you, you know, what a lot of conservatives would like to do is they say, okay, here's China rising, so we need to build a containment barrier uh, around China in the way that we did around the former Soviet Union. And that was, you know, part of what motivated a lot of the revitalization of a lot of bilateral American defense commitments to India, Japan, you know, uh, Mongolia, you know, uh, and so forth. But the other uh, way that I favor uh, at this point uh, more is a set of institutions that include China and, and give them a stake in uh, an existing institutional order in East Asia. Now, one that I wrote about, not only in this book, but I, I wrote this in Foreign Affairs two, three years ago, is, uh, you know, you've stumbled into the six-party framework for dealing with Korean, North Korean nuclear weapons, why not convert that into a permanent OSCE type uh, Northeast Asia security you know, forum among Japan, China, Korea, Russia? Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and if you think about, you, know, for, you just take a practical problem. North Korean regime collapses, and all of a sudden there's this big vacuum, and the country has to be rebuilt that is going to be the source of huge tensions between South Korea and all of its you know, neighbors, particularly Japan, but also the United States and Russia, China. If you had a forum by which you could talk about this stuff uh, ahead of time, uh, I think you could handle that transition uh, much more effectively. And then there's, uh, you know, the Asians are really good at producing all of these um, uh, multilateral organizations that don't seem to actually do anything, like uh, you know, APEC and ASEAN and, you know, ASEAN plus three. But I think that, you know, actually in that group, uh, there are some that could be used uh, and given a greater uh, security role. The economic stuff is happening by itself. You know, after the Asian crisis, you had the Chiang Mai initiative and, and other things. But so, so there is a, actually a much more detailed agenda that I've got if you, if you actually have the patience to, to work through that. So. Yes, on this side. Uh, yeah. Oh. Every administration seems to have different aspects of it which it relies on heavily for foreign policy advice, whether the Secretary of State or Vice President of the NSA. How can the next president build their cabinet or build a group around them where they get a balanced amount of advice? And yeah. Advice? Well, uh, the structure is there to do that, right? The National Security Advisor is supposed to be a neutral arbiter between all of the cabinet agencies. And what the National Security Advisor is supposed to do is to actually give the president a range of, uh, of opinions. And I think the thing that will be held against Condi Rice in future history is that she didn't do that, uh, you know, she didn't do that adequately in the lead up to the uh, Iraq war. The other important institutional player that could play that role is the vice president. Uh, because the vice president, you know, could be the one that steps back and uh, sees the role of that office as protecting the presidency itself, including protecting the presidency against, you know, bad advice, you know, from 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 the cabinet. And then, obviously, in this administration, you had a 
very powerful vice president that leapt into the policy debate with very strong ideas of his own as to you know, what the proper uh, outcome uh, could be. Uh, I have frequently thought, though, that this problem is an unsoluble one. Uh, it, it's really funny, I mean, talking about coming back you know, to Cornell uh, and repeating some of the mistakes of Vietnam. I mean, I think that during the Vietnam War, there were these uh, ideas about the imperial presidency and groupthink. And I remember when I you know, read about this stuff in graduate school, I thought, ah, that's stupid. You know, people don't actually think like that. And, and you, know, you get much broader advice and so forth. But you've actually seen this in play, uh, not just in this administration, but I think in a lot of administrations. So the groupthink, you, know, you have this bureaucratic tribalism in which the Alternative policies are there, people are articulating them, but you simply don't want to listen to them because it's being articulated by the other tribe. And this is something that's very hard to appreciate unless you've actually worked in a bureaucracy in Washington. Your loyalty to your bureaucratic tribe trumps all other loyalties. Uh, and you don't want to see, you know, be seen as, as, um, uh, as, as violating that. And it's a psychological phenomenon, and I'm just not sure that there's a a kind of institutional uh, uh, solution to that. The, the, uh, the imperial presidency part of it uh, is, is the following, that the office of the president is so powerful that even with the best of intentions, it is really hard to create a presidential office that is not full of sycophants, basically. Uh, that want to, you know, they, they, they want the president to do something and therefore they're going to tell the president whatever they uh, and in fact, Big uh, Brzezinski, who was Carter's national security advisor, told me his office is just down the hall from mine. So he was saying once that, you know, e even Jimmy Carter, who was the most mild-mannered, you know, humble president when he came into office, uh, that uh, Brzezinski was saying that in the first year of the Carter administration, he could go into the president's office and say, Mr. President, I think you really, this is wrong, you know, you should consider an alternative policy or criticize something the president said. He said by the fourth year of the Carter administration, you couldn't do that because everybody just expected, you know, you'd be deferential to the president. The president didn't want to hear, you know, someone with really strong opposing views. And as I said, this is Jimmy Carter, you know. This is uh, Mr. Nice Guy. It wasn't, um, you know, hard-charging George, uh, George W. So, uh, again, I'm just not sure what the, uh, what the solution uh, to either of those problems is because I don't think you can you can fix this just by moving around the organizational boxes in the you know in the office of the in the old in the executive office. Um, Perhaps one, one more question. Okay. Uh, yes. You, you mentioned that uh, when you coming back to Cornell after 37 years, yeah. you didn't see the armed student protest. You think that this is a progress? But, uh, I didn't see uh, weapons. I, that's what I. I yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Because as Mark Lee said, the militia is very important for mm -hmm. the public. Mm -hmm. So the draft system, I think, is a modern equivalent to the militia. Mm -hmm. So without draft, he says that the, you mentioned the yeah. State Department of Canada are not, do not have a well perceived plan, but I ask why. Because they are not under pressure, they, yeah. they lack the democratic accountability. Yeah. So I wonder, you no, I think that there is a, you know, uh, the political pressures that led Nixon to create a volunteer army were understandable, but I think under uh, ideal circumstances, it would be better to have the draft back, uh, make everybody subject to it, include, and no college exemptions. You know, I got a college deferment when I was at Cornell, so I didn't uh, serve in the U.S. military, but I think it would actually be better uh, to have everybody serve, including the children of all the elite decision makers that you know, make decisions on whether to go to war, because if you're going to do it, you ought to do it as a nation and as a, as a community and, and share in, you know, uh, in a lot of those risks. But, and, and I think um, you know, there, there are a lot of people, I think, that are actually quite worried about U.S. civil-military relations because for vast number of American elites, they're never going to meet you know, someone in the military. Their families you know, don't have people serving. Uh, the families that do serve, it's a tradition in their families. They live in certain parts of the country. You know, South is way overrepresented in you know, kind of red state America. And it just means that there is a real difference in worldview between the country and, uh, and its military. And that's not a healthy, uh, 
that's not a healthy situation. And you're right, I suspect that that's why they're not armed students. If you're all being drafted to go to Iraq, I think you'd probably worry about it a little bit more. So. <laughs>